This is a podcast from BFM 89.9, the business station. Hello, I'm Hanif Baharuddin. You're tuned into the show that brings you closer to the people and places of our capital city. According to the World Bank, Malaysia is now an aging nation with more than 7% of our population at the age of 65 years old and above. This number is expected to double by 2044, making our society an aged society by then. With this in mind, it's important for us to start having conversations about how to deal with an aging population and how we can accommodate them better. In this episode, we're going to focus on city design for the elderly and how our cities should be designed to be sensitive to this section of the community. Joining me to do this is Ali Sabrina Ismail, Director of Architecture from the Faculty of Built Environment and Surveying University Technology Malaysia. And she's going to get the ball rolling by defining some parameters of the conversation. Before I explain actually how you're going to design a city for the elderly, I think it is best for the listeners actually to understand how can we define the word, the term, the terminology of elderly within the context of Malaysia itself. So, um, and let me set the scenario for for the discussion by looking at uh, the terminology of elderly, and then we look into elderly itself in the Malaysian context. Uh, most of us know that when we talk about the elderly in many newly developed country, the chronological age of the elderly is usually 60 years and above. So, 60 years and above is actually the the age that is well accepted. Uh, as known as the elderly or older person. So when we talk about elderly, um, it is actually the classification of old age may vary between countries and over time. And it looks into um, how does the elderly actually can serve to the society, um, not only as the workforce, but also their role and also their position uh, in the context of the economy of the country and also in the context of the political situation in the country. So if we look into this case, when we talk about the old age, it is actually divided into three main categories. One is the chronology of the elderly group itself and um, their position or their change in the social uh, role in society and also their capabilities in terms of the society, in terms of how they serve the society and and, and things like that. And um, when we talk about Malay Malaysian context, uh, looking to the Malaysian context, especially in the demographic statistic, we know that by the year 2030, almost 4.5 million uh, from the Malaysian um, overall total population will be comprised of the elderly community age 60 and above. And um, by looking a lot of scholars and demographies, they had done studies and they had done estimation that the population of the elderly group in Malaysia will actually gradually increase from 1 to 2 million for every 10 years. So this indicates that the elderly communities uh, in the Malaysian context are actually progressively accumulating over the coming years. And we need to be have a good expectation and, and we need to have a very good preparation because by the year 2035, Malaysia itself is going to be projected to become one of the aging nation. And when we talk about aging nation, um, it is actually very crucial. It is actually a very uh, important issues that we need to look into. And there are some certain things that we need to look into, which means that not only in terms of the uh, facilities that we're going to provide for the elderly, but we also need to look into how are we going to accommodate this elderly in terms of their living spaces, uh, in terms of their needs. And also we need to look into how we're going to promote and advocate a better built environment, especially for these uh, elderly people uh, in catering their elderly needs. And one day also, Hanif, you're going to get old. I'm also going to get old. <laughs> and yeah, it, we, we cannot run from, from getting old because everybody will go to that stage so okay. this is this is the, the the thing that we need to look into and when we talk about the golden age is that we need to look into how we're going to not only enhance the quality of life but what are going to to give the best out of life for these elderly people so when you talk about the word um the elderly city um it is crucial for us actually to now to look into how we're going to build actually an age-friendly city. So when we talk about an age-friendly city here is that 
a city that actually can encourage active aging. So active aging meaning hereby we need to optimize the opportunities for the elderly's health, their participation and their security in order to enhance uh, the quality of life. And when I mention about the age-friendly city here, Hanif, there are actually four important things that we need to look into. Number one is that we need to recognize the great diversity among older person itself. Uh, number two, we need to look into how are we going to promote their inclusion and the contribution of the elderly in all areas of their community life. And number three is that how are we going to produce a built environment that actually can respect their decisions and their lifestyle choices. And number four is that we also need to um, have a, some sort like a proposition or, or maybe a program or, or maybe uh, some sort like an ideation. What are we going to anticipate? And how we're going to respond to these aging related needs and preferences. So these are the four important key points that we need to look into when we're going to design an age friendly city. Yeah. Mm, all right. So when it comes to designing a city based on that four criteria that you mentioned, right? Um, how can we go about, I guess, thinking about it in a more practical way. For example, like 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 you know, what are some of the things that we should prioritize? Um, should it be more community driven, making sure that I guess um places are more accessible for the elderly in terms of not only logistics but also perhaps maybe um proximity? What what are some of the ways we can I guess start thinking about and be sensitive to when it comes to I guess designing a city for the elderly? Yeah, when you talk about designing city for the elderly, um, first of all, I think it is the role and responsibility of the planners and also the designers to understand the characteristic and the behavior of the elderly itself. So because now we are young, so we don't have that, uh, what we call that um, consideration because we have not entered into that golden age yet. But there are a lot of case studies, there are a lot of examples that we'll need to look into. And to me is that, Understanding the behavioral pattern or what we, what I call that is that the, the psychological reaction of the elderly is very important. So in this sense, when we understand how is the first size of or what you call that the psychological being of the elderly, uh, then we can actually understand what should we give to the elderly in that sense. So there are actually eight well-being aspects that we need to look into when we talk about the elderly behavior. One is their psychological, the safety, security needs, the social needs that they want, the self-esteem and also self-actualizing needs. So in this sense, um, when we design the facilities, uh, it is very important to integrate and embed the elderly cultural values into that principles. So these elderly cultural values, like I mentioned, is that you need also to look into and uphold the elderly feeling of having community spirit, you know, compliance values. And when we talk about the elderly, once when you go to grow old, you don't want to stay alone. You must need to have companion. And in that sense, you need to have prefer an environment uh, or spaces that actually can accommodate gatherings. And you want to be with your family, your kin members, your good friends, your colleagues. And this actually is important for, for the psychological being of the elderly because they need to strengthen the spirit of the ukwa you know, a togetherness, the community spirit and things like that. And when we talk about the elderly also at the golden age is that the spiritual well-being, you know, um, and, and how you're going to enhance, especially if you are Muslim, uh, we always talk about spiritual enhancements, you know, kerohanian and things like that. So these actually need to be propagated and this need actually embedded as part of the elderly living. And not only that, uh, the elderly also like to have uh, what you call pl pleasant and also comfortable situation where they can build interaction and have harmonious kind of relationship. So if we understand the concept of the age-friendly city, firstly, we need to look into the physical environment and the city's infrastructure. So when we talk about the physical environment, the city's infrastructures is the way that embedded in the in the setting in in the living setting that we have the environment that we have 
for instance uh if if the elderly lives in 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 a residential area is the infrastructures actually support the living harmony or not are there a lot of active spaces that respond to the needs of the elderly cultural needs that why i mentioned just now that actually enhance the community spirit the compliance value does it strengthen the spirit of the ukwa among family members among the neighborhood or among colleagues and friends and things like that so these are actually critical um because when we look into um the way how we design the cities uh, the facilities are actually are disintegrated you know um when you have housing area the mosque is very far away the park is very far away so it is quite hard for the elderly to go to all of these facilities within proximity or within walking distance and also when we talk about this um there are actually um five important key points that when we talk about the principles of building an age friendly city number one is about the idea of usefulness so when you talk about usefulness street connectivity is very very important like what you mentioned just now uh, hanif which means that the public service the facilities that i mentioned just now must be within a walkable distance so which means here when you talk about public services and facilities it involves public transport services you know residential facilities commercial facilities uh, and second one is about also comfort so comfort which means that When we design the cities, the urban infrastructures must have a series of standard of criteria and quality. For instance, um, it must accommodate the needs of the pedestrian, especially the senior citizens. Must have a lot of pavements, you know, continuity of sidewalks, you know, installation of ramps, uh, and also in this sense, um, the the width of the sidewalks also need to be adequate, uh, and that it can provide and support this comfort of walking, you know. And when we talk about walking within certain distance, you need to promote like pocket green spaces, you know, for the elderly that they can sit down within the green. areas uh with trees with comfortable benches uh and also with safety and security also in that sense from shade from rain and from sun and safety is also the key point because when you talk about safety of the senior citizen it is very critical so which means in this sense you need to have uh what you call that walkway and an environment that is actually absence of barriers you know obstacles you don't want to have potholes on the sidewalks because sometimes when the elderly walk they might fall down and they get injured and things like that and um in terms of visibility also is very very critical and very crucial so visibility which means that while you cross the road you know all those intersections uh, safety in terms of installation of cameras or maybe um on how you put the the sidewalks and things like that is also important and um when not only that it also involve uh, attractiveness so attractiveness which means that um you need to uh what you call that involve the five senses of human like touch smell see hear listen and things like that so these are actually important that actually can integrate with the elderly because sometimes some of them might have um disable in certain things like um seeing they cannot see far maybe because of of blindness or things like that uh and maybe uh deafness you know so all of these are actually critical in terms of creating more livable cities with a uh, cues we call it cues like using colors uh using uh clear road signs uh using uh maybe um landscape that can give certain smells so this actually can support way finding for the legibility for the elderly so that that they can actually know where they are walking and and they can navigate themselves and things like that so this is actually crucial uh for for the elderly so this is five key points that i can see the most important things when designing uh, an age friendly city yeah There was Ali Sabrina Ismail, Director of Architecture from the Faculty of Built Environment and Surveying, University Technology Malaysia, sharing her thoughts on city design for the elderly. We're going to make way for some messages. Stay tuned. I'm Hanif Baharudin and you're listening to I Love KL on BFM 89.9. BFM 89.9, you're listening to I Love KL, bringing you closer to the people and places of our capital city. I'm Hanif Baharudin. 
Ali Sabrina Ismail, Director of Architecture from the Faculty of Built Environment and Surveying University Technology Malaysia joins me this week to talk about how cities should be designed with an aging population in mind. She's given us a lowdown on the things we need to take into consideration when it comes to designing a city that's sensitive to the more senior members of the society earlier on the show. Now I'm curious to know whether our cities are designed to be friendly to the elderly. Here's her observation. Um, if looking at the Malaysian context, um, we have a very nice city at the moment, uh, like Kuala Lumpur, uh, Johor Bahru, you know, big cities uh, with, with a lot of uh, facilities. But we still did not fulfill the requirement uh, of, of talking about having the perfect cities that actually can serve to the needs of, of the elderly, not only the elderly, but the needs of the whole communities uh, in terms of gender and also in terms of age group and things like that. And there are still a lot of lacking that I think we need to look back into on how to redesign back to have a very good city in, in that sense. So, for instance, uh, when we talk about uh, the city that we have nowadays, uh, we still have lacking in terms of proper contextual responsiveness. So, in this sense, we still lack in terms of providing um, good qualities of cities elements, like I mentioned, in terms of proximity, distance, um, attractiveness, uh, giving comfort, like urban infrastructures. The cities that we have nowadays are mostly designed for cars. Okay, we have large roads, big roads, and and when we talk about designing cities for cars, which means that um, we actually ask people to drive everywhere that we go. So in this sense, we are lacking to have a lot of pedestrian network. So if you look into good example of cities like Copenhagen, you know Copenhagen is one of the most good sustainable city, and it is repeatedly by a lot of uh, critics, uh, designers, and they always mention that. Copenhagen is the most sustainable, is a livable and is the happiest cities on earth. Okay, So Copenhagen, if you look into how the way they design, is that they don't look into a life-size city which like overwhelm the citizen or the people who live in the city with arrogant engineering of architecture. But they look into how actually you want to encourage people uh, to walk with a lot of widespread of pedestrian network. And when you have a lot of uh, spaces for people, uh, you're making places and spaces for people in the city, uh, you will actually look into design that is sustainable in this sense. And you will, you will encourage people to walk more, spend more time in public spaces, whether you are old, whether you are young. And this actually encourage people to enjoy the cities to their fullest potential. Yeah. So I think we need to look back on how we design our cities. Yeah. Yeah. Earlier you mentioned that um, the elder community, um, you know, they prefer companionship, right? And to a certain extent, I think maybe there is, uh, in our culture, maybe there is that familial relationship that should be cultivated as well. Um, but there's also companionship among each other as well, right? Um, so how... How can that be encouraged? You know, especially when, you know a very anecdotal example is that sometimes you can see, you know, the elderly they they enjoy hanging out with with people of their age group as well, right? Especially when they have retired. So so can that be encouraged a lot more in the city, in the comfort of their own homes? Yeah, and and especially if you think about you know for for people who might not be living in landed properties, you know, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, it makes sense, Hanif, because uh, this is where we need to look into intergenerational spaces design. So intergenerational spaces design here means that we are not only looking into designing uh, spaces only for the elderly usage, for the function for the elderly, but also when we talk about intergenerational spaces, we can actually design spaces that integrate the young and the old. So, and, and we can have a lot of these kind of spaces, even though you are living in high rise or, or landed property or low rise. It is the way how we design the community spaces. So, which, which means that, um, I always uh, like to, to, to talk to my students is that when, whenever you design a public building, for instance, please look into intergenerational spaces. So, intergenerational spaces means that, uh, spaces that accommodate both age groups. So, and by, by doing these intergenerational spaces is that you need to integrate it with life activities. 
So life activities here means not only the physical activities, but it can also like um, encourage phys- what you call spiritual activities, um, uh, activities that relate to communities, services, and things like that. So and and you can have it uh if you're living in high rise you can have it in alternated floors for instance uh two levels and you can have a community spaces a small gathering spaces and then uh within another different levels also or or maybe you can create notes and pocket spaces within the the existing spaces itself so this is quite important because um by having that if you look into the instance of I always like to use the uh, the the example of Malay Kampung Village. Okay, so if you look into the beauty of the planning of the Malay Kampung Village is that the way how they design the houses is just like close by within the kinship area. For instance, you have um, five clusters of houses and you have an open space. So that five clusters of houses, they tend to integrate with each other and communicate each other within the, the small community areas that they have. And in the evening, you can see um, old people playing chess. You can see children playing, gassing in the field. And you can see all the um, women uh, uh, sitting at one corner uh, within the women community. And you can see the elderly mingling with the children and with, with the kids, with the grandsons or granddaughters. So these are actually the way that the spaces are integrated with each other. So it enriches in terms of, of the spatial planning layout. So, but but in the city's design that we have nowadays, we are lacking in terms of the design because the most city design that we have is actually segregating people, you know, according to grid lines. Um, and, and, and you have the commercial in the middle, the residential at the end, you know, and then the transportation hub at the end. So that's why the networking doesn't merge with each other. So the, the connectivity is separated in that sense. So this is where that we, we need to revise back and, and look into how actually can we design a kind of a more organic design kind of a concept for cities. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so one interesting thing about um, how our cities are designed these days is the uh, adoption of technology as well and how, I mean, these days, um, I guess the simplest example is we're, we're, we're big on e-wallets these days, right? Um, everything's going cashless. Um, I mean, I think uh, these things are a good thing to, I guess, ad- adopt. But do, do you have to bear in mind, um, you know, people who might not be able to uh, adapt at such a rapid pace to these changes, you know? And are these also the things that we should also be mindful of when it comes to uh, making sure our cities are, I guess, um, friendly to the to the elderly community? Yeah, I think um, we cannot avoid technology. Because technology is embedded with us in, in, in the 21st century. And I think the young generation also live with technology. And the elderly also, we cannot left them out with the technology. And, and they have to, to, to learn the technology in, in order to cope with the current context and with the current environment. And in order for them to, to also live side by side with the young, young generation or the young group of people. So I think this is how uh, the way on how we're going to manipulate the technology so that it can benefit the old and the young. So I think technologies nowadays, like uh, if you go to to um, developed countries like in Copenhagen, you go to Seoul or you go to Tokyo, um, technology actually can help and, and can be taken given the fullest advantage, especially for the elderly. For instance, I'm taking example um, like showing wayfinding. You know, you can use technology to, to give wayfinding for the elderly, to, to allow them uh, for cues in cities. Uh, in, instead of making them lost walking in the cities, they can give directions uh, by using um, technology that can flash out colors, you know, billboards, signs, uh, languages where they can actually press and can give them direction uh, in, in, in certain instance. So, for, for instance, also... Um, when you talk about technology, uh, not only talking about this digital technology, so technology that actually can encourage multi-sensory experience. Um, so this is, this is actually can integrate the, the how can cities actually, um, help not only, uh, giving wayfinding, 
but also providing services uh, and and allow the the people to move around by using their body and senses to take the advantage so that they can enjoy the cities to their fullest potential. So there are many things that we can explore uh, when talking about uh, technology here, whether and how we're going to adopt it and transform it into certain needs of of of, of age group and 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 uh, the needs of the people, especially the elderly. So I think, yeah, there's, there's nothing wrong of having technology embedded into city design, but it is how we're going to exploit the technology uh, into a more positive usage that is very critical. Yeah. All right. Okay. Um, can you give some practical examples of things that we can perhaps change immediately to make our, especially public spaces, more age-friendly? Um, and, you know, when it comes to perhaps maybe indoor spaces, perhaps, or, you know, public toilets, things like that. You know, are there any examples of the top of your head that you can give to, to I guess, immediately make some practical changes that can be implemented immediately, I suppose? Um, yeah, of course. Number one is that um, the immediate thing uh, is that ban cars into cities, okay? So when I said ban cars into cities is that when we design the cities, we need to design cities that encourage people to walk more often, uh, over the course of their lives and, and especially when making their daily commute. So this is when, when we talk about asking people to walk is that you need to have a community oriented city. So, but to have that also, you, when you ban the cars, you need also to make public transportation more equitable. So, and if you make public trans- transportation in cities more equitable, not only the elderly can benefit because some elderly, they cannot drive cars into cities. You know, they might use public transportation. So this actually can promote equalities in the cities. So when we when we achieve more equality by having a good public transport, it will become more accessible and efficient. And and, and also the cities will become the public life of, of the driver for the urban design. And this will make the city more exciting and interesting. Um, and, and when it is it's more interesting by by not by not having a lot of roads, by not having a lot of car, the city will become more safe uh, and and more secured in that sense, and and people are, are free to walk here, to go there, and, and it can create a lot of pedestrian networks, and it can create a lot of integration, and 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 this actually can promote what I call is that um, social participation, which is very important. And when you have a, a social participation in the city, it is actually can increase this ideation of a diverse life within the city. And um, when you have a diverse life, you can create a more sustainable city in that way. So you can have a lot of greeneries, you can have a lot of parks, you know, you can have a lot of uh, uh, what you call that uh, pocket spaces, nice places to sit and, and enjoy the fresh air and things like that. So if we can actually have that ideation of ban cars into cities, I think uh, it will actually turn out the whole city to become a more sustainable and livable city. Yeah. Mm. What can other stakeholders do to make the city more inclusive for the elderly? What what can we, perhaps, you know, the younger generation also, you know, what can we do to play our part in making sure that our current city is, is I guess, more inclusive? And, 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 you know, changing the design of a city is one thing, but yeah, are there any other things that we can do to, to make our cities uh, more sensitive and also inclusive for the elderly? Yes, number one is awareness. <laughs> yeah, awareness means that it has, I know, it, it starts from the neighborhood itself. So in the neighborhood itself means that um, how are we going to create a safe city? Uh, so in safe cities is that sometimes when, when we live is that we cannot do anything because the city is already planned for us. But it is how we maintain the area that we have. So the safety, for instance, like the walkways and things like that. Sometimes we we as uh, as uh, city dwellers, we need to have a sense of sensitivity. Like when we walk uh, along the roadside, you know, and sometimes you can see there's potholes and things like that. Maybe we can actually take action to it, you know. Uh, sometimes certain, certain things like a small sensitiveness actually can help for, for a better, uh, what you call it, a better development and it can actually help to build uh, uh, what we call that safety, legibility, in, and comfort also for others. So uh, sometimes we cannot do much, you know, like like creating uh, 
sitting places, you know, a safe uh, benches, uh, a dedicated like urban furniture for for resting and things like that. So this actually that we can contribute also in in small manner. Um, but but I think this actually start from from um, small to big, which means from from uh, from what you call that, not from the from the bottoms up approach. So in this sense that we need also to work together, you know, not only as city dwellers, designers, private sectors. So all of us need to provide a better living environment, not only to elevate the living quality of the elderly, but also for among the young generation also, especially in urban areas. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm, yeah. And this is something, like you said earlier, something that, that is quite imperative for us to start thinking about from now, right? Technically, especially for the younger uh, generation out there. It's not something that, you know, we we can think about later, but maybe now because yeah, at the end of the day, healthcare is getting better, which means that people are gonna live longer, and therefore we need to be mindful of the fact that you know a city should be designed to be inclusive for all ages, right? Yes, yes, it is, it is, because um, when when we talk about uh, that, we need also to understand that. Um, it is high time for us, especially for 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 Malaysians, to change to become a, a more community oriented city. So, in this sense, it's not only my responsibility, but it's also your responsibility and uh, our responsibility as a whole society. So, if we if we look into that uh, and everybody play a role and have a very uh, own responsibility, I think we can turn. Uh, our cities now to a more comfortable living and healthy lifestyle, not only for the aging community but for all community and society in Malaysia. Yeah. You've been tuning in to I Love KL, and that was Ali Sabrina Ismail. She's the director of architecture from the Faculty of Built Environment and Surveying, University Technology Malaysia, and we've been talking about city design for the aging population, especially for the elderly community. That's all we have for this episode of I Love KL. If you miss any part of the show, you can check out the podcast at bfm.my/ilovekl, our app which you can find via Google Play and the App Store, and you can also get this podcast on Spotify. Don't forget to also follow the station on Twitter at BFM Radio. My name is Sanif Baharuddin and you have been tuning in to I Love KL, bringing you closer to the people and places of our capital city. Join us again next week only on BFM 89.9, The Business Station. You have been listening to a podcast from BFM 89.9, The Business Station. For more stories of the same kind, download the BFM app.